Good day, everyone, and welcome back to the Cyber Minutes podcast. Today, I'm joined by Flynn and Connor, and we're doing a bit of a different sort of episode today. So, Flynn, why don't I let you just uh, address what we're going to do for today? Yeah, so basically, something that me and Max have been speaking about fairly frequently recently is we've had a lot of different guests on with a lot of different stories, and typically, the format of our episodes is not necessarily interviewee type, but a very discussion. You know, we ask a question, they give their answer, then we ask a question. Something that we want to sort of experiment with is, you know, letting just the the speaker take the reins, not the speaker, the guest take the reins. Um, this is something that we've been speaking about since the introduction of Cyber Minutes because, you know, we've had guests like uh, Kerwin and Neil who have such a plethora of stories and, you know, because of the format of our current uh, podcast is that it's very question to answer, question to answer, rather than, you know, just letting them go on a tangent. So because of that, and we're thinking that with a returning guest and also a very good friend of ours, Connor, Connor has recently produced a paper. Uh, he's been on before talking about Aparte and the great work it's doing against scammers. Uh, Connor's paper has been out for probably a month around about that at this point, Connor? No, a few weeks. Okay, a few weeks. Um, but yeah, so we're going to test it with this week with Connor, um, and then we're also going to just do a bit of question and answer at the end. Um, so Connor, why don't you take it away? Tell us about your paper. Yeah. Thanks for having me guys. It's great to be back. Um, I've got my paper here. Um, if you want to look it up on the internet, you can search, uh, convocation, one word. Uh, it's the full title is convocation colon smart reuse of chatbot responses. And that's basically what I do in this. And it'll so be in the description as well, so yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. So, the description. That'll be great, yeah. The idea about the paper is pretty simple. If you have a GPT language model that's really big, a bit expensive to use, maybe you also have voice synthesis after to make it talk in audio, um, it can be expensive to use. And you can use it for answering questions or a variety of tasks. But if you have a very large scale then you're probably going to have a lot of requests that are very similar. And in computing, there's this thing where you can use a cache to fix redundancy. And normally if you have, say for example, accessing memory uh, multiple times, then you're accessing redundant information. So you can use a cache to make that faster because you're doing the same access multiple times. But then there's also different types of redundancy. So for example, there's fuzzy redundancy where it's kind of similar, but not quite. Like if you're accessing variables in a list, for example, um, that's nearby. And semantic redundancy. So semantic redundancy is when the request is different. It might be, for example, GPT request. It's a different string, different sentences, but the meaning's kind of the same thing. Like you could ask, what time is it? And you could ask, what time is it now? Those two things say the same thing. And the answer would be the same. So it's redundant to process both requests. And basically what we do in this paper is we scale up that idea of solving semantic redundancy with a cache and scale it up to a larger, more complicated model where we have GPT responding, not in question answering like other papers have done, but in conversation, hence the convo cache. And the way we do that semantic redundancy, because it's a bit of a difficult task, is just simple, small language models. Before GPT came out, before all these large language models became so popular, I mean, we had Roberta, but um, all these little, small models around, around 2018, 2019, um, that actually do really good language processing. And they're really small. You can run it on your computer very easily, very quickly. Don't even need a GPU. And you can do these similarities uh, measurements very easily. Um, yeah, that's pretty much how the paper goes. Awesome. That sounds really, really cool. So it's, it's if I was just to sort of dumb it down a little bit, what it is is it's taking requests that are similar and uh, processing them uh, in the same way so that there's not extra time or extra money being used to process two very similar questions. That's exactly it. Awesome. And the way we do that is with these little models and 
what these language models let you do is you take an input of some text, some uh, message, a few sentences, some question, any any text, but preferably not too long. And you put it through this encoder. And then at the output, you have a vector, which mm. is a fancy maths term for like a point in space. Like if you have, say on a, on the planet, you have coordinates, it's your kind of your X, Y position or your longitude and your latitude. And if you have those two numbers, then you can say where you are on the globe. And if those two numbers are similar, then you're in a very similar place and those two places are close to each other. Maybe one number is similar, but the other number is not very similar, or then they're actually really far away. So you can't just look at um, each number and see if they're close. You have to look at the whole thing. Um, but it represents a point. And when you encode text with a encoder model, for example, you use um, a few fine-tuned models, but they're based on Roberta, which is similar to BERT, but Facebook. And the output of that is a vector. It's got more than two dimensions. It's actually a thousand or so dimensions. Um, but it's just the same thing. It's a point in space. And if you have two vectors, then you can see how close they are. You could measure the distance between them. Mm. It's a complicated line, but it's a straight line uh, in right. higher dimensions. One thing I'd be curious about, so you mentioned that you did it specific, specifically with Roberta. How, I suppose, scalable is a solution like this? Can you do can this be applied to many different models or is this something that's currently got a sp very specific use case? Um, yeah, basically, how do you see this being used in um, the industry in the future? Well, there's a lot of models that do this sort of task and the task is normally called uh, semantic similarity or semantic textual similarity, STS. And the idea is if you have a bunch of text um, sentences, utterances, questions, uh, you want th this task is about um, encoding them into vectors such that similar messages are grouped together and dissimilar messages are not close to each other so that you can then encode any new message and see what it's similar to um, and also measure that similarity. And that's exactly how these models are actually trained. They're trained with dummy text or text that's been labeled as two things that are similar and maybe a third thing that's different or maybe they pick a random thing and assume that they're different and they just say do whatever it takes to put these things close to each other and learn how to do that mm. and they get better so these these models are actually very small like i said uh in terms of gpu memory usage they're a couple gigabytes so pretty much any any gaming gpu can do that not the fancy new ones but pretty much anything you've ever owned can do this. And you can even do this on just a CPU. It On a GPU like we had, um, it took a few tens of milliseconds. On a CPU, it will take a little bit longer, but in the end, you can very feasibly encode a single text and get a vector out. And in terms of scale, um, Convocage really benefits from scale because... I haven't got to it yet, but um, we build this big database with every text that we've seen, mm. and we have all the vectors for those texts, yep. and then for each new text that we get, we compare it with all the other vectors to find the most similar, and that's how we know which response to reuse. So we have a bunch of requests, and we generate responses for those requests, and when a new request comes in, we haven't generated a response yet. We search for a similar request in the past, and then we reuse that uh, response for this new request, as long as it's similar. If it's not similar, then you know it, and we can make a new response for that, and then add it to the database. So in terms of scale, um, you might think that checking the distance between every vector in a database with millions, maybe billions of previous utterances will be slow, but there's a couple of really cool things that other people much smarter than me have uh, figured out how to do that. So one of the first things is, um, like I said, these vectors are kind of like points in space and you can measure the similarity as the distance between them. But there's actually a different thing you can do. 
So instead of measuring the distance between them directly in a straight line, because if you have a thousand dimensions, instead of just two dimensions, it actually takes a long time to compute that. There's a, a lot of square roots, um, which are slow. So instead, we can measure the angle between them, which is a bit of a weird idea. But if you imagine back to maths and geometry, if you have the origin point and you have a, a graph with two points, you can imagine uh, taking a line from the origin point, the zero point, and then drawing it to one of your points, and then another line to the other point, and then measuring the angle between those two points. And if those two points are, they might be different distances from the uh, origin, mm. and that will actually not be encoded in this measurement. Um, but the angle between them is kind of like the similarity or the distance between them. If they were in opposite sides of the origin, then they'd be as far apart as they could be um, by this measurement. And if they were, the angle was very small, then they're probably going to be quite close. And there's another step with this. Um, you can normalize all the vectors so that they're all um, one unit vector away from the origin. So they're the same distance from the origin. And then you can measure the distance or the angle between them extremely quickly. It's a couple multiplications, which a computer can do super fast. Yep. Um, it takes the time down from like uh, many, many factors, orders of magnitude uh, faster. Yeah. So we can scale up with all those. We have a faster similarity measurement. And we actually train the models on this measurement instead of the a straight line distance, which is known as the Euclidean distance. Mm. Um, but instead, we use the angle between them, which is either called the inner product, because that's how you calculate it, it's very fast, uh, the products between them, or uh, the cosine similarity, which is like the inner product, but only if they're the same distance. Complications that aren't important, but it's a measurement of how similar the two vectors are. We train it on that, and it's much faster to compute especially for these high-dimensional vectors. I'm sure any of our computer science students know all about uh, Euler. <laughs> yeah, Euler. Um, yeah, Euler, Euler. There was a funny inside joke Connor, Max, and I had in uni. <laughs> but um, just to give the audience a bit of a real-world world perspective, how would you say this um, benefits Aparte? So Aparte, we spoke in a previous episode about how... Um, you know, we talk to scammers and how it's basically wasting scammers' time. How does the Convocash solution that you've presented, how does that benefit Aparte? Yeah, so Aparte's main goal is to scale as big as we can. Um, we also have another important consideration, which is how fast we can respond. Uh, so Aparte is talking to scammers um, with like a, a GPT to make responses and then a voice synthesis to make it talk back to the scammers. And hopefully the scammers don't realize they're talking to a bot and they can have their time wasted. Mm. So the important thing is that we have really good quality bots. The voice needs to sound great. The The uh, actual response text has to make sense. We have uh, some other smart decision making that we have to do. Um, but it has to be good quality. But good quality comes at a cost. So GPT 3.5 is okay. GPT-4 is better, but it's much more expensive. But it's better, so we want to use the best model that we can. Um, same with voice. Voice is extremely expensive, kind of because there's not many options at the moment that are good enough, um, so they're just charging a bunch of money. But it's expensive, and no matter what, it's going to be a bit too expensive for our use case. The other thing is we need speed. So if we use these more complicated models like GPT-4, um, compared to maybe, say, a llama with 7 billion parameters, and we're using GPT with 100-something billion parameters, mm. it takes longer to make that response, even on equal hardware. And if you get bigger hardware, it's going to be more expensive again, just to make it faster. So um, we're roughly hitting one or two seconds of latency. Um, somewhere in that region, I can't say exactly, but it's around that. That's what I've written in the paper. So we're trying to cut that down, and there's some other great 
research um, from Interspeech, which is the same conference that this has been published, my paper, um, which I, I love, by the way. And uh, they looked at humans talking to each other, and they found that humans typically respond in about uh, 0.1 to 0.3 seconds. So 300 milliseconds is the goal, and we're not near that yet. And then they also looked at, they got humans to um, to place responses with a delay from a previous response. So someone was talking, then another person um, was talking as a response. Mm. And they were asked to place it in time. And they were asked to place it um, as naturally as they could, and then as late as they could without being unnatural mm. of a pause. Um, and they found that the limit that people typically like is around half a second, and they can kind of, uh, kind of, it's okay if it's up to one second, but beyond one second, no one likes it. Everyone thinks it's unnatural. Um, so that's a, a great research, and it's super useful, and it gives us the goal of being about half a second. Nice. Yes. So do you, so at the moment, Connor, do you have any stats on how Convo Cash or like any statistics on how much it improves by or how um how much better it is able to uh, process and you know spit out new new um new information compared to uh, the more I'll say traditional way of doing it? Yeah. So um, our main measurement, well, our two main measurements is going to be uh, saving money because mm. aparte. Uh, isn't just in the market of talking to scammers, but talking to millions of scammers constantly because um, we need a scale so that we can have an impact. So how much we can avoid using these models. So if we cache something and we reuse it, we're not generating it brand new, so it's cheaper. And the, the hardware for storage and uh, vector lookup is much smaller, so it's cheaper. And the other one is speed, um, how fast we can respond. So that depends on the hubber that we use to do this and the models, there's some better models that are slower um, and so on. But in my paper, what we did is, and this is the main experiment of the paper, we took a data set which had generic chit chat conversations. Um, it was used for training models and doing a bunch of different tasks. Um, and it had a training and a test split. So we took the training split which is much larger, yeah. about, uh, if I remember, it was 67,000 um, prompt responses. So like a thousand conversations, but we took each uh, each utterance and response as a thing. Yep. And we put that into our cache. So we put the training set into our cache, uh, we encoded them all, and the impact of that in terms of time doesn't have an impact because it's done in the past when you're looking at a new conversation. Um, and then for the test split, we assumed that that was using the cache. So we took every response pair in that test and we tried to look up the cache. And there's a few questions there. How do we know when the response is good enough? And um, how long does it take? So how long does it take? Uh, for us, on a single GPU, it was an RTX um, A4000, uh, mid-range GPU and the encoding took about 10 milliseconds super fast the similarity search which is on GPU so it's a bit faster but mm. you can do it on CPU and it'd be a, a little bit slow but not that much that was 1 millisecond for a cache size of about 67,000 so pretty not made massive case cache but uh, it scales pretty good because yeah. yeah. it's cool search um so one millisecond so that's 11 milliseconds so far to get as many responses as we wanted this is not just the top one this is the top everyone um it was an exhaustive search so it could be even faster but one millisecond is good enough so we got um a ranked list of all the best responses that we could use and well we can just pick the first one and use it but then that's the second problem is how do we know the response is good enough? So we can try and use the first response. And we found that it wasn't that good because it's just not that good most of the time. Mm 
Um, I mean, most of the time it is good, but there's a good chunk of the time where it's not that great. And that tends to be when we haven't seen that context before. So you can't expect the cache to have a good answer because it's a brand new question. Um, yeah, so we we looked at that. Uh, the average, yeah, so um, the extra step that we had to add was some other small model to evaluate how good uh, yeah. the response was. Yeah. So we have all the responses that we can use and we know what the conversation is. So we can use a small model. This one's uh, based on T5, another small language model before GPT came from Google. Yep. Um, and there's a trained model on evaluation called UniEval. It's great. It does uh, coherence measurements specifically. Has a few others, um, which are really cool. But coherence measurements are designed to measure how well a response fits into the context of the conversation which is exactly the potential problem that we have picking a response from a different conversation. So that's the measurement that we used. Um, but that one is a bit of a bigger model. The running that on our GPU um, took about 100 milliseconds. And that's per each response that we check. Yep. So the initial way that convocation could work is you pick the top one, and that would be the fastest. But it doesn't work that good the second way would be to pick the top one unless the distance or the cosine similarity um, is too high. Yep. So if the similarity is, if it's not very similar to anything we've seen before, we can assume it's going to be bad. Yeah. We looked at that across this data set and the problem was there wasn't a super high correlation. There was a correlation and with a massive data set, we had strong confidence in that correlation. But um, I don't have a thought with me at the moment. But if you take like only the best matches and you only use those, you would get almost perfect responses. Mm. But you would only be able to use those 10% of the time. Right. So your hit rate would be about 10%. And that's terrible. Uh, in Aparte, we don't care if it's not as good. Actually, having a bad response can be useful because it wastes yeah. more time with confusion. Yeah, I was, I was about to say Aparte is a weird uh, use case for this because sometimes that having that bad context could be not necessarily a bad thing. I feel like it, having this in, built into a different system where, I don't know, maybe it's a chatbot interacting with a client, having that really good context, really, um, I suppose, fast and also accurate is beneficial but aparte is an interesting use case because if it gets it a little bit wrong it's not necessarily bad definitely yeah yeah and uh just to get to the point where i get the results so if you if you go for the second obvious solution which is limiting the distance then you only get about a hit rate of 10 percent, or you can get a higher hit rate but you'll also get worse responses because yeah. as you go um if you go with a more lenient threshold um, where you're getting more than 10% hit rate, it's more than 10% of the time you're using the response, um, You, the majority of the new ones are bad. Well, not a majority, but it goes from like 99% good to maybe 70% good. Mm. Um, it, it, it's, it's more like a coin toss if it's good or bad at that point. Yeah. Right. Um, so not, not perfect. So that's where we thought we should have this third threshold which is a evaluation threshold. So with a small model, evaluates it, and then that model can decide if it's good or bad. Um, and because that model takes some time, we first evaluate the first response to see if it's good, which it, most of the time is the best response um, or is good enough. And then maybe they're all good enough, but the first one's probably the best. So we look at the first one, if it's good, we use it. And that's the fastest possible response. It's about 110 milliseconds yep. in total. Um, but then if the first response is not good, then we have to check the second response and see if that one's good. And if that is good, we can use it. And that takes about 210 milliseconds. So each response we go down adds 100 milliseconds. Um, maybe you can parallelize this in production, but we weren't looking at that um, in this synthetic case. Yeah. So uh, we can look at that 
And once we get to the fifth response, we give up. If the top five are not good enough, we've already waited half a second, which is too late to wait. And we're going to have to generate a new response and wait for that. But there is a trick for that, which I'll get to in a sec. Um, but if we do that across all of our uh, test data set, and we say that we want a uni eval coherence above 90%, which doesn't really mean anything. Um, it's not a even scale from 0 to 100. It's kind of like uh, confidence in the response being good. So 90% 90, 90 coherence doesn't mean 90% quality. It means 90% confidence in it being a good response and 10% confidence in it being a bad response. So it's either 100% or 0% most of the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if we only have 90% coherent responses based on this small language model's um, opinion, uh, and we go across the entire test split, then we have an average latency of 214 milliseconds. Mm. And that's okay. factoring in the first response being fast, the fifth response being slow, um, and how often we hit the first response, second response, and so on. So we, the first response gets used 57% of the time. And then if that fails, then um, we use second response if it's good. Uh, and we only miss 11% of the time. So 11% of the time, none of the top five are good. And at that point, we've taken half a second to figure that out. And we need to generate a new response. But we have a tactic for that. And it's based on that research I said before about the timings of responses. Um, they included a second test case where they had the responses start with a uh, an um or an ah. Mm. An um or an ah, some back channeling responses, some thinking word that would like just delay what they are going to respond with. And they found that the the participants gave those responses the same delay. But that's a delay to the start of the um. So if you think about it, we have the speaker that we're going to respond to. They're talking, and then they stop talking. And then the, the clock is counting from there. Yep. We uh, figure out what they said with some speech-to-text model. Um, that takes some delay, which we haven't included in this. Uh, that's a couple tenths of a second, mm. depending on who you, who you use. And then we start processing our response. So after a couple tenths, we've got convocation starting. And then another one tenth of a second, we check the first response. And if it's good, we can use it. But if, if it's bad, we keep going. And if we keep on checking down to the last response, that's half a second gone. And now we've realized that we need to generate a new response. So that's when we can send an um or an ah and use that to buy us more time. So that um or, um or an ah gets sent after about eight tenths of a second or maybe one second, which is within the range of natural human conversation. And that and it'll sound fairly natural. It'll just be like, it will sound fairly natural. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then we can have some time to generate a response, which, like I said, takes one or two seconds. Hmm. So you can have a one or a two second um, uh, and so on. So we can generate a response even if we have a cache miss. And it should be natural. And the key thing which is why we can't use that um or an ah um, every time, is the fact that using it every time is unnatural. Yeah. If you if you said um after a second, every single time you were talking, it would sound weird. Yeah. But in this case, we only have an 11% miss rate. So 11% of the time, we have to do that. So it makes it much more realistic that we're not doing it every single time. I mean, we have the example here, especially in the earlier episodes, Max and I would all, all the time be, um, uh, and then be like, oh, it's like this. And we'd have very similar, I suppose, outputs that you would say from an AI perspective. And that would be saying the same things all the time, which it kind of comes across as unnatural. But, um, and 11% is, I would say is very, very, um, Good. normal. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's normal. I, I mean, <laughs> for... The, those first few podcast episodes it was probably up in 
uh, around the 25. The 50s. 50% <laughs> 50 <laughs> every second <laughs> sentence. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but we edited out a lot of it. Um, yeah. Maybe one day we release the full episodes and, and see the disaster. <laughs> I think I might just I might just release only the ums and the ahs. This is going to be an hour and a half episode of all the ums and the ahs from the first four episodes of the podcast. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, going yeah, back on the track a little bit. So, Connor, how, if you were just to ballpark it a little bit, how much cheaper, in your opinion, do you think this would make uh, a... Uh, a product like Aparte, not exactly Aparte, but, you know, something similar, maybe we'll say uh, it's sort of scaled up to, uh, maybe we'll say about a, uh, maybe there's a, about a million conversations being had over a, over a week or so. So fairly, fairly big. How much cheaper would this uh, make that chatbot? Yeah, well, it, it depends on the cost of hosting Convocation, but it's it's very small. So we need one GPU, a small GPU. You could probably run it on a CPU or an optimized system. Um, you need a, a cache which can store stuff. And caches are actually pretty cheap. You can run it on like Redis, for example. Uh, they have vector search on CPU. Uh, you can use uh, Fice, which is the one I use, which is more for research and experimenting. But it's GPU, it's Facebook's uh, AI similarity search. You can use any of those and it will just use some some memory but not that much because it's only 1000 numbers for each thing which is not that big so the cost is actually quite small you do have to store uh the responses as audio if you're doing audio yep. um you can also just res just store the text responses from the gpt um depending on what steps you want to skip out to save your costs and it doesn't cost that much for storage when we're comparing to uh, inference on large language models or inference on these uh, very proprietary speech models. It's much cheaper. So the cost is almost neg negligible. Uh, at scale, it doesn't increase that much. And when you get more utterances in your database, in your cache, then the likelihood of hitting them is greater. So your hit rate will increase. And the hit rate's the main thing. Because if you have a 50% hit rate, then you're going to use the cache 50% of the time. It's very cheap. And you're going to use the GPT or the LLM or the, the voice synthesis 50% of the time, which is going to be your majority of your cost. Yep. And if we can get up to like 90%, which in the experiments I've done here on a relatively small database of 67,000 responses and only... 6.7 thousand conversations um that's already at 89 percent hit rate mm. it's a bit of a synthetic scenario but you can imagine that in some cases for example aparte scammers will be using the same scripts and scammers will be talking about the same sort of topics as opposed to anything so it's gonna hit that cache a lot of the time mm. so it can get up to like a 90 percent savings Wow. Because it's almost free when we use Convocation compared to how expensive these models are. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. Imagine walking into a, a big uh, a big company that, you know, has some product or some feature that's, you know, an AI, uh, either a, you know, voice to text or a... Uh, this, this would work for, like, text to te text as well, wouldn't it? Exactly. You can yeah. just, it's, instead of it's generating a voice off at the end, yeah. you just save the response yeah, yeah. well uh, imagine presenting that and telling them that they're going to save 90 percent of their cost you know that could be a bit, a bit of a bit of a no-brainer there <laughs> yeah and that's an interesting point is how this can be used in say for example other uh, use cases mm. and that draws attention to one of the really key things about aparte is that our users so the people talking to our chatbot our users are scammers and we don't like scammers and scammers don't like us <laughs> unless we give them money and we're not going to do that so so we're actually fighting our users and if we use uh, if we reuse responses from our chatbot and we don't generate new things then we're not misleading anyone mm. and our scammers they're not going to fight us um and yeah, it helps us. But if you replace 
our example with, say, for example, uh, ChatGPT, if they did this and they used the um, semantic redundancy, so similar questions, similar prompts, but not the same prompt, and they gave you a reused response, then they're being dishonest about generating new responses for you every time. And if they're charging you for it, that's it's not very nice. Um, but I mean, there's a lot of use cases and there's other research in this topic where they've done question answering stuff. There's another one where it's um, voice assistants. It's another really good use case. Uh, if you if you ask um, a voice assistant, I'm not going to name one. Uh, I don't want to set them off. Uh, but if you ask this assistant uh, for the weather and you say it different ways, then the output's the same. Yep. So there's more specialized models that are doing semantic redundancy in those sorts of things because they also have to make sure that they're correct. They have to make sure that the two response, the two prompts or the two questions actually have the same entailment and the same exact answer mm. so they can give the same answer. Yep. Uh, whereas conversations are a bit more open domain. Uh, you can kind of respond to anything and you kind of just have to get the the form of the question right and the topic of the conversation right um so yeah so apartheid is a really good use case for it because we don't have to worry about misleading our users we're fighting our users um but other companies they could use it to some extent but i hope people don't start finding out that gpt is just reusing stuff and not giving them new things yeah, I, I think, like, to an extent, it sort of makes sense. Like, imagine how much money, uh, you know, OpenAI would save if every time someone asked, how big is the Earth? Like, what's the radius of the Earth? You know, it, it used a, uh, a response that was cached beforehand, mm. you know. That, that's uh, got to be a very common kind of question. And feels like it's not one that really doesn't need a new generated response every time. The, the Earth's radius isn't really going to change <laughs> by that much uh, unless we get hit by a big asteroid or something right um but uh yeah things like i feel like as well open AI is kind of the the big sort of case here something that i was i would be thinking of is if a company has a a chatbot there that's integrated into their website say they're a an insurance company of some kind and they've got a chatbot that does you know some kind of responses there's a back end that connects to open ai in that case, when they have customers that are typing in questions and it's giving them an intelligent response, that case, I can see, you know, this being very useful. Imagine if you're uh, typing into a bot that wants to answer your questions and you're asking, hey, can I get a quote? Can you imagine how many times that would be written into that chatbot? It would be, you know, almost every second uh, request would be, hey, can I, you know, what is my quote for this? Yeah. Yeah, I, spo I suppose that would be also a different use case as well because I don't think users would be typically upset that they're not getting a newly generated response. It'd be a similar thing to a parte where, mm -hmm. you know, people, when you're getting claims, you, you're expecting to get the best claim. You don't want a new claim just because it's new. You want the you want the best claim you can possibly get. You'd like the precedent be set that this person got this claim. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like that would actually be another good use case. Yeah, definitely. It could be used in those situations where the user isn't expecting a new thing to be generated and they're not paying for that. And it's kind of just a separate service that they want outcomes rather than generation of new things. Yeah. I feel like it's often, it, I would argue that's often the case rather than not. I would rather a good output rather than a new output with mm -hmm. most AI systems that I use. Um, mm -hmm. That would be different depending on who you're talking to. Like if you're ever talking about something creative, you want something new. Yeah. Um, but it depends on the model. Definitely. So, Connor, how good are the responses? Like we've kind of uh, brought it up on the uh, on the sort of confidence level that um, that of you know how how much of the time they're right. But you know how good are they? So, after we've selected the responses, and in some cases we don't have a good uh, similar prompt to use. So we don't use the response and we hope that they're bad. We hope that we selected the bad ones to choose not to do. Um, but the ones that we do use, so we also in this paper, I went through and I, I didn't manually do it. There was, there was too many. So I used GPT 
Um, but it's actually a really good evaluation model. So that I talked about uni eval, small T5 language model, mm. good for fast evaluation, but it's not perfect. There's another technique called GEVAL, which does something that is very clever. And it's actually similar to what uni eval does technically. So it takes GPT, GPT 3.5 or GPT 4, and it has a big long prompt that says, look at this dialogue history and rank it based on how coherent the responses are, and then give me a score from one to five, one being bad, five being good. Um, and then it tells GPT, um, give me your score here. And then GPT's response is to give it a score from one to five. And the way it actually gets the final score is it takes those one to five um, numbers, one, two, three, four, five, which are possible responses. And it uses the probability of generating those digits. And then it takes a weighted sum uh, to calculate what the actual score is. So if it um, says five with 100% confidence, then the score is five. But if it's 50-50 between a score of 4 and a score of 5, then the score is 4.5. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how it works. I think it's a very clever way of using GPT and getting uh, fine-grained responses with decimal points and everything. Um, it's great. So uh, we used that and we applied it to every response that Combo Case generated. Um, and we didn't apply it to the ones that we didn't use. Uh, since we chose not to use them. And after that, we got a score. Um, we took it as a percentage as opposed to 1 to 5. Um, so we took it for GPT-3, gave us a score of 67%. So that's roughly 3 point something out of 5. Not great, not terrible. Uh, but then GPT-4, which is a much better model um, for this task, I'm not just saying that because we've got a higher score, but they um, evaluated it and compared it to human evaluators on different data sets and GPT-4 scored better. So GPT-4 gave us a score of 76%. Okay. So like 3.8, 3.9, almost a 4 out of 5. So not terrible. Um, if you make a new response with GPT, it would be better by the same metric. But... It's pretty good for reusing responses, mm. and most of the time they're very good. So I think we'll show a graphic um, soon somewhere on the screen. If it's, if you're watching in the video, it will show you um, an orange section, which is randomly picked responses from the cache, but picked randomly, and they're mostly terrible. And then it will show you green section, which is the reference responses. So the data set has responses that it shows you. Um, that they should be good and they're measured as good in most cases and then we have a black line which is the responses that combo cache made and for gpt3 it's very similar to the reference gpt3 is a bit of a harsher um, evaluator and gpt4 it's not that similar but you can see there's a big portion of responses that are very good and then a small portion of responses that are very bad um, so yeah so we use both of those models uh, and this is also with the uni eval coherence being above 90%. Um, so two different automatic models saying that these responses are pretty good. Mm. Um, and just anecdotally uh, looking at them myself, they look pretty good. It's pretty impressive what it can do. Um, so yeah, that's our, the results of the paper. We can make the latency down to two tenths of a second, down from over a second. Mm -hmm. We can respond within the crucial time period of what people expect. And we can do it about 90% cheaper. Amazing. That sounds awesome, Connor. Well, thanks so much for coming on and um, and giving us a bit of a, a brain explosion there. Um, <laughs> like a, a, lot of new, a lot of new information. Um, I might have to listen back to this episode a few times, I think, to, to fully grasp it. But yeah, it sounds it sounds absolutely awesome. So thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Charlotte.
Thanks for listening. Just a reminder that the Cyber Minutes podcast is for educational purposes only. The views expressed by hosts and guests are their own, not necessarily their employers. Advice discussed is general advice. We promote ethical discussions, not illegal activities. Have a cybersecurity question? Send an email to cyberminutespodcast at gmail.com as we'd love to answer it. Stay cyber safe.